I'm Peter Glick. I'm the president of the Pacific Institute in Oakland, California. I'm going to talk about the connections between climate change and water resources, one of the most critical resources facing us today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about climate and water. I'm going to talk about what we already see happening with the climate changing. I'm going to talk about what we can expect to see in the future. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can do about it, what society might do to prepare for the unavoidable impacts of climate change on water resources. First of all, what's the connection between water and climate? Well, the hydrologic cycle is the climate cycle. Water and climate are very closely connected. Evaporation, the formation of clouds, condensation, precipitation, runoff, back to evaporation, that's the hydrologic cycle and it is the climate cycle. And it's those water resources that humanity depends on for everything we care about. We care about water because it's tied to food production. We care about water because it's related to energy and industrial production. It's related to human and ecosystem health. It's related to forestry and infrastructure. Water is one of the most important resources and it's one of the greatest challenges we face today. Even without climate change, we face a whole series of water-related challenges. There are a billion people worldwide that don't have access to safe drinking water. Two and a half billion people that don't have access to adequate sanitation services. We have water contamination and water scarcity. We have deteriorating ecosystems as humans take water out of the environment without paying attention to what the impacts on natural ecosystems will be. We have deteriorating infrastructure and lack of investment in providing the water services and the water conditions that we really want as a society. We see ongoing disputes and violence over water resources. And all of these things are now going to be worsened or exacerbated by the growing risk of global climate change. Let me talk a little bit about what a two degree warming might mean or a four degree warming, because it now appears that it's going to be hard to avoid a two degree warming worldwide. And unfortunately, it may be hard to avoid a four degree warming as well. Two degrees may not sound like much, but if you're a human being and your temperature goes up two degrees, you have a serious fever. If your temperature goes up four degrees, you're heading for the hospital. And the truth is it's the same story for the world. A two degree warming is unprecedented. A four degree warming would put the world in climatic conditions that human beings have never experienced in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. And that's going to be a challenge for infrastructure. It's going to be a challenge for the society that we've built. It's going to be a challenge for all sorts of things that we really care about. For example, a two degree warming alone means greater floods. It means greater droughts in different places at different times. It means disappearing snow and ice. It means more of what falls as snow is going to fall as rain, and that's going to be a challenge for water management systems. It's going to mean more demand for water by agriculture. Two degree warming means higher temperatures, more evapotranspiration, a greater demand on the existing challenged water system that we already have. It means we're gonna see more evaporation, and that's going to be a problem for natural ecosystems. It means more extreme events and greater monsoon seasons, and perhaps a shift in the timing of monsoons. It means uh, changes in water availability in our rivers and streams. By some estimates, a two degree warming may mean that the area of the Northern Hemisphere that gets snow is going to drop by as much as 25% or more. By the end of the 21st century, by some estimates, glacial volume, the amount of water stored in glaciers in the mountains, could drop by 30 or 40 or 80 percent under some scenarios. And that's going to be a water management challenge. Let me give a specific example for the Himalayas. The Hindu Kush region, the Himalaya region of parts of Asia, uh, covers eight different countries. It, we see the Himalayas in uh, Afghanistan, in Nepal, in China, in India, in Myanmar, in Pakistan, eight countries of Southern Asia are covered by the Himalaya Hindu Kush region. This region contains some of the biggest mountains in the world. It contains some of the biggest glaciers in the world. And the water resources from the, from the Himalayas feed some of the biggest rivers of the world, the Yangtze, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, uh, the Mekong, the Yellow River, the Salween River. 
These rivers, the rivers of the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, provide water for water supply and for irrigation for a billion or a billion and a half people on the planet. And as climate changes, it will change the water availability and the timing of that water availability from the Himalayas. And that's going to be a challenge for feeding much of the world's population. It's going to be a challenge for flooding events in the Himalayan region where we already see severe floods that affect billions of people. Uh, and it's going to be a problem for water resource managers uh, in many of these countries. We see similar changes already occurring in glacial regions in the Alps in the United States, in the Andes, in South America. By some estimates, Glacier National Park in the United States, which used to have 150 glaciers and now has 35 glaciers, may by the end of this coming century, because of climate change, have no glaciers at all. Uh, that's going to be a challenge for natural ecosystems and for water management. Sea level rise is also a challenge associated with both climate change and water resources. We know that sea level is going to go up. In fact, we know that sea level is already going up. A warmer world means the oceans will warm up, and a warmer ocean takes up more space than a colder ocean. As glaciers melt, they add volume to the ocean, and that's, that's increasing our sea level as well. Rising sea level means greater threats to coastal aquifers, groundwater systems where salt water pushes farther inland. Rising sea level also means threats to coastal ecosystems where salt water and fresh water merge. Higher sea levels mean salt water will push further and further into those ecosystems, affecting not just the health of those ecosystems, but where and when humans can take water. And we know that sea level rise is accelerating around the world. We know that sea level rise will affect a whole range of things that we care about. As much as 10% of Southern Asia's agricultural lands may be vulnerable to climate change as well. But sea, sea level rise is not the only threat to agriculture. We're going to see changes in rainfall patterns. We're going to see rising temperatures that puts more demand for water by agricultural crops. 75% of Sub-Saharan Africa is rain-fed, and that's vulnerable to changes in rainfall patterns. And a four-degree warming could put as much as 35% of Sub-Saharan Africa's cropland unsuitable for agriculture. All of these things in turn will affect political security. We already fight over water resources. There's a long history of conflict over water around the world. We fight over access to water. We fight over shared water resources. We fight over water contamination. We fight over water infrastructure. And climate change is going to affect political tensions as well. Finally, human health is affected by not just climate change, but climate change's impacts on water resources. Many water-related diseases are going to be worsened by increased flooding events, by increased temperature that permits vectors like mosquitoes to breed more effectively. Cholera, dysentery, typhoid, malaria are also expected to be greater threats under a warming world. And these water-related diseases kill millions of people every year. Finally, water management itself is going to be a challenge because we've designed and built our infrastructure as though the future climate's going to look like the past. And if there's anything that science is telling us, it's that the future climate is going to be different than the past. And that infrastructure is going to have to be managed differently. It's possible that new infrastructure is going to have to be built to different standards. And water managers are just beginning to wrap their minds around how to manage water under a changing climate rather than a static climate. Combined, all of these threats mean growing scarcity of water, growing stress over water resources. But we need to act. We already know enough to take action today. There's plenty of things that scientists can do to improve our understanding about regional impacts, about changes in rainfall patterns. But those uncertainties are not an excuse for inaction today. We know enough to act. And the, the good news is that there are things that we can do today. We can manage our water resources differently. We can look for new sources of supply that are less vulnerable to climate change. We can use our water far more productively and efficiently than we do. We waste a lot of the water that we use today. And if we improve water use productivity, we can reduce our demand for water. We can reduce pressure on water ecosystems. We can reduce our vulnerability to climate change. 
There are economic tools that will help us manage water resources more effectively. Smart pricing for water and water, ma water markets are a good tool to help manage water more effectively. There are new technologies that help us use water more carefully. There are things that we can do at an individual or a homeowner level. We can buy more efficient appliances like wa washing machines and dishwashers. We can change our gardens to use less water. Uh, we can change our industries to be more efficient. We can grow more food with less water with irrigation technologies that let us be more productive. All of these things can help us reduce our vulnerability to climate change and increase the effectiveness and the success of our water management systems. In addition, as individuals, there are things that we can do to learn more about these problems, to follow organizations and institutions, to learn about the science of climate change and about what we can expect in coming years. We can work with our local water managers. We can vote. We can support policymakers that are thinking about climate change and thinking about how to reduce our vulnerabilities to climate change. We can reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases that will reduce pressure on the climate in the future. We have to do all of these things. We must not just work to reduce the effects of climate change in the future, but we have to work to adapt to those climate changes that are unavoidable, that we can't prevent from happening. It's time to act, and the good news is there are things that we can do today to reduce our vulnerabilities tomorrow.